Welcome to ETH, news and headlines from a prophetic perspective. Here at End Time Headlines, our mission is to inform our listeners of the times and seasons in which we are in. In Luke 21, 28, we are told when you begin to see all these things come to pass, lift up your heads, your redemption is drawing near. And now, founder and pastor of End Time Headlines, Ricky Scapero. So nevertheless, I want to welcome everybody that's going to be jumping on here on Facebook Live via by Facebook Live or by YouTube. Again, I'm Ricky Scaparo, the founder, the pastor, and the voice of End Time Headlines. Today, I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove to you uh, from Scripture that we are seeing uh, an attempt to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit in the church today. Again, there is, a, there is an assignment from the enemy um, who is trying to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit and its uh, and His activation uh, and His works in the church today? So that's where we're going to go today. Uh, we're going to go to the Book of John again. It's good to see a lot of people on here: Mary, Sonia, Lisa, Shirley, Linda, everybody that's jumping on here this afternoon, and those who will join us as we go on here. So we're going to go over to the Book of John, chapter fifteen, is where we're going to start. John fifteen eighteen. We're going to read on down and we're going to go into John 16 and I'm going to show you some stuff here uh, real quick. Again, uh, while, while you guys are turning there, if you want to follow, I'm going to go ahead and share this uh, on another page as well so we can get everybody to jump on board that, uh, that would like to join us today. Again, I'm going to be discussing, if you're just joining us, I'm going to show you from Scripture out of the book of John that there is an assignment, an absolute assignment to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit in the church today. Here we go. John chapter 15, verse, we're going to start at verse 18. Listen to the words of Jesus. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Verse 20, remember the word that I have said unto you. A servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, Jesus speaking, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Now, who sent Jesus? The Father. Remember, Jesus said, I'm, I'm about my father's business. Verse 22, John 15, 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they, now this is extremely important here. If you're taking notes, uh, if you have a highlighter, if you have a pen, underline this. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Let me say that again. Jesus said, if I had not come into the earth and spoken and revealed to them what sin is, they would have not known what sin is. But now, somebody say now, they have no excuse for their sin. And then verse 23, he says, he who hates me, hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works, the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. He's speaking of the Torah. He's pointing back to the old covenant, the old Testament. They hated me, Without a cause. It's interesting how today you got all kinds of preachers that will try to to persuade us or try to uh, tell us not to, to, to relate to the Old Testament, not read the Old Testament, not preach from the Old Testament because it's not relevant. Yet through all Jesus' ministry, he consistently quoted scriptures from the Old Testament and the Torah. The disciples consistently quoted scriptures from the Torah and from the law and from the prophets. But it's interesting how we go fast forward when you go to 2017 and you've got a lot of preachers and a lot of ministers and a lot of pastors and so on and so forth that will try to 
discourage you from reading from the Torah, discourage you from reading from the law and the prophets. Hmm, something to think about. Now let's go back to the text, John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, somebody underline helper, or you can highlight it, means the word helper means in Greek it's perikletos. It's one uh, or one called along the side of another to, to for help or to counsel. Okay, this is what this word means. All right. So he says, when the helper comes, the perikletos, the Holy Spirit, whom I shall send to you. Who send in the Holy Spirit? Jesus. I will send it to you from the Father. Where The Holy Spirit is coming from where? The Father. Who is sending it to us? Jesus. The Spirit of truth. Who is the Spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost. The Paracletos. The Comforter. Watch this. Who proceeds or He comes from the Father. He speaking of Holy Spirit, will testify of me, speaking of Jesus. Okay? Now, verse 27, And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, let me give you a little principle here today. Do you want to know, you know, the Bible says, Test the spirits and see if they are not of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the earth today and are deceived and are deceiving many. And it says you shall know them by what? Their fruit. But it also it tells you in the word of God that we are to discern by the spirit in which they operate. Now, Jesus gives us a clue here. He says you will bear witness of the work of the verbiage and of the nature of Holy Spirit when he has come from me. In other words, there's an authentic and there's a counterfeit. Somebody say that with me. There's the authentic and there's the counterfeit. If the Holy Spirit is authentic, then it means there's demonic spirits that will masquerade themselves. And according to the second Thessalonians, they will be able to perform lying signs and wonders and even false miracles in the last days to deceive even the elect. But he says here, if you've been with me from the beginning, in other words, if you if my word is in you and and uh, and 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 if you are in my word and my word is in you and you abide in me and I abide in you, you will love me. You will keep my commandments. Come on, and me and my Father, we will make our abode in you. Come on, somebody, we will set up our kingdom. Jesus said, "The kingdom of heaven is within you." So Jesus wants to come into our hearts and be a part of our lives and set up his throne in our own hearts. But see, the ones that will be deceived are those who were not with Jesus from the beginning. They don't have part in him and fellowship and communion with him. The word of God is not in them. Come on, somebody. The truth is not in them. So let's go on. Let me let me read on down here. Verse 7 of John 16, 7. Oh, I'm getting ready to drop a, the bomb on this thing and show you without a, a shadow of a doubt that we are seeing an assignment to silence the Holy Spirit. I've not lost our text and where we're going. I'm just building a foundation to get to where I'm going here today. John 16, 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is still Jesus speaking. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper, here it is again, the Holy Spirit, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, meaning go back to the Father, that's where he's at right now. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. If I depart, I will send him to you. Who's he sending? The Holy Spirit to us. Verse 8, here we go. Here's where I wanted to go with this. And when he has come, by the way, he's already here. He's in the earth. When he has come, he will convict the world. Did you hear that? Once you underline that, look, I'll underline it right here. I want you to underline this or highlight. The Holy Spirit, his mission 
when he comes, not only is he to be a comfort to us, not only is he, is he come to be uh, one to come along the side and aid us and comfort us and exhort us, come on, and remind us of the promises of the Father, remind us of the promises of Jesus, and, and he is going to speak that which is given to him by the Father and through Jesus or as a mediator to that, but he has also come, according to John 16, 8, he, when he comes, he will convict the world of, now here's three things, ready? He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Let me say that again. If you're taking notes, the Holy Spirit, his mission will be to convict the world Though he will convict the world of three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And consequently enough, as of the taping of this message in 2017, it is consequently enough, it is these three things that are being silenced in the pulpits and being discouraged from being preached on today. And it's preaching on sin, the preaching on righteousness, and the preaching on judgment. But yet, isn't it interesting that Jesus said when the Paracletos comes, the helper, the helper, the comforter, when Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, I want you, you've got to, you've got to hear what this preacher is saying to you today. Isn't it interesting that today it is, we are seeing these, the, these three things are no longer being preached behind the pulpit today. These are not popular messages. They're not going to, they're not going to bring in the masses the, they quote unquote drive people away. They're not bringing the big offerings they're, It's not entertaining people. It's not tickling the ears of people. It's not making them comfortable. It's not a popular message. Therefore it is discouraged from being preached, being taught on and being advocated behind the pulpits yet isn't it, isn't it interesting that it's the Holy Spirit's mission to come? One of his statements is that he would come and convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So friend, we are in dangerous territory when we, as a preacher of the gospel, whether you be a pastor, a prophet, a teacher, an apostle, whatever the case may be, any of these Five-fold ministries for the operation or for the equipping of the saints. Whatever your office is, I don't care. And you may not be behind a pulpit. You may be behind a cash register. You may be behind an office desk. You may be behind a factory uh, assembly line, whatever the case may be. And if you're a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you refuse to preach on sin, righteousness, and judgment, you have in essence put a put tape on the Holy Spirit's mouth, you've clamped his mouth, and you've silenced him. You have quenched the Holy Spirit from speaking through you. You realize that when the, when, when the Holy Spirit came from the Father, sent by Jesus from the Father to us, the entire purpose of this, let me just read my notes here. When Jesus was on the earth, his core message, now you go and study this out in the New Testament. When Jesus was on the earth, his core message was on sin, righteousness, and judgment. Therefore, the Holy Spirit has come in his place and he works and operates through you and I as the body of Christ to continue his message through us so that we might fulfill Matthew chapter 24 that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into the whole world as a witness and then the end shall come. But it is, isn't it interesting that the devil, he knows that he can't eradicate the earth of Bibles. He knows that he can't wipe us. He cannot wipe all the Christians out on the face of the earth. So what he's done is he has systematically interweaved his hand into the body of Christ, into the church and behind pool 
pulpits and he's convinced preachers of the gospel, whether it be a pastor, an evangelist, an apostle, a teacher, a prophet, whatever the case may be, he has convinced them to not preach on these quote unquote controversial subjects. We don't need to preach on sin. We don't need to preach on righteousness or right standing or holiness unto God or sanctification. All those can be right there in righteousness. And don't preach on judgment. All right, now let me give you some scriptures here. Let's go back up here to sin. Interesting enough, it says in Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He who believes in the gospel and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now those were the words of Jesus, but you got preachers today that won't preach that. But Jesus said, you've got to believe, you've got to be baptized, and you've got to be saved. Or less you're condemned. Condemned to what? Condemned to hell. Yes, hell exists. Hell is real, and it is literal. It is not figurative, and it is not an allegory, and it is not a parable. It, hell is hot. Its flame is not quenched. Come on. The worm never dies. It's outer darkness. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth and a separation of eternity from a living God. And Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he says, he that believes and is baptized will be saved or they'll be redeemed. And he who refuses or rejects the gospel will be condemned. What am, what's this preacher talking about? I'm talking about the preaching of sin, the preaching of sin. John 3, 16 through 20, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes believes in him should not perish that means to be separated from God for eternity but have everlasting life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but the world through him might be saved he who believe now listen to the next verse nobody ever preaches on this he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Okay? John three thirty six. He who believes in the Son, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, when was the last time you heard that preached behind the pulpit? But those were the words of Jesus in John chapter 3. John chapter 5, verse 24. Most assuredly I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. So friends, listen. If we refuse to preach on sin, we are doing a great injustice for souls. And we are, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. And we are, in essence, are rebelling against the great commission that was given to us by Jesus. Because this was the purpose the Holy Spirit came, was to empower us to do the works of Christ, which was what? To preach the kingdom of God, to, to preach a message of repentance, that men should turn from their sins, that men should turn from themselves, and they should turn unto a living God. John chapter 8, verse 24, Therefore I, sa I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, who, the Son of the living God, Yeshua, the Messiah, the, the way, the truth, and the life, and that through no, the no other way is there a way to, unto heaven but through the name of Jesus. He says in verse John chapter 8, verse 24, You will die in your sins. John 10, 26, But you do not believe. Because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. So again, it, it's no wonder that the enemy has been successful in removing the preaching 
against sin, the preaching of the conviction of sin, the need of repentance, the need of coming to the altar, the need of getting deliverance, the need of being redeemed, the need of having a Savior and a Lord. So the enemy has come in and he's put a zipper on the preacher's mouths. But friend, it's deeper than that. It's not just putting a zipper on the preacher's mouths. We are putting a zipper on the mouths, the, the very mouth of the Holy Spirit. Again, John 16 says when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he, he will convict the world of sin. Why do you think when we preach the word of God, when we preach the gospel, why do you think that men run to the altar? Why do you think men weep? Why do you think that men wail? Why do you think when Peter stood up on the book and, uh, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and he preached the gospel that the men were cut to the heart and the Bible said meaning meaning they were convicted and it, and the Bible says that the men came to Peter and says what must we do? And Peter says repent and turn from this wicked and perverse generation. But let me go on again in John 16, verse seven or verse eight, Holy Spirit comes and he will, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. We talked about sin, but let's talk about righteousness. Isaiah 64 says that we are like an unclean thing and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Because I, I can hear, I can hear the, the, the kickback on this message and the opposition on this message. Well, brother, we are all, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. We, we can't make ourselves righteous. And he took it all. And I, listen, I get that, friends. But friends, I'm going to tell you something. Yes, he paid the penalty for our sins. Yes, he went to the cross for our penalty. He went to the cross to save us and redeem us from a devil's hell. But that doesn't give us a license to continue. I, we touched on that a couple weeks ago or, or last week or whenever. All these messages run together on me. Romans 6, Paul talked about this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we, which we've been saved, how can we sin any longer? Okay, let me read on this. Romans 10, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. 1 Corinthians 1 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ became for us righteousness, sanctification and redemption. So I'm not preaching against what Jesus did. I'm not undermining what Jesus did, but Watch this, Romans 3, 22 through 25, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all who believe, for there is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God sent forth as appropriation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. In other words, Jesus was our example. If you again go to Romans chapter 6, he was he, he died upon the cross. He was buried in baptism and was raised to new life. And you as I, as believers in Christ, when we give our hearts to Jesus, when we say yes to him, we are in essence burying the old man. We are burying the old man and the sins thereof. Come on. And we're being raised up in the newness of life. Therefore, we no longer choose and we no longer willfully choose to walk in sin, but we want to walk in the newness of life. The Bible says, walk ye therefore in the spirit so you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, let me go on down here. 
2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, here's where I believe, this is what I call the distorted grace gospel has messed up and they come along they've come along and they their message of this hyper grace is that jesus did everything he paid it all so therefore you and i we don't have to do anything we don't we don't need to read our word we don't need to pray we don't need to live a disciplined life we don't need to be sanctified we don't need to be holy and set apart we don't have to give up our old lifestyles we don't have to give up our old uh, habits we can continue to do the very things that we were doing before we said yes to Jesus and guys this is contrary to the word of God when you read line on line precept on precept here a little there a little when you take the scriptures in context from the uh, from uh, all the way let's just talk about the new covenant under the new covenant under the blood of Jesus all the way from the uh, from the book of Matthew all the way to the book of Revelation the Bible stresses a lifestyle to try to pursue righteousness holiness and sanctification any any other word that is contrary to godliness is a false doctrine and is a doctrine of um, of uh, of lasciviousness is what the word of God says. It's talking about an, uh, an abomination. Now I read this the other day. Let me read this because the Holy Spirit brought this back to my remembrance. If you go over to the book of Jude, here's what Jude says. Watch this. He says, uh, and in Jude chapter one, he says, certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? So these Jude warned us of men that would come in by stealth into the body of Christ and they would turn the grace of God, the message of grace, into lewdness, into loose living, immoral living, no standards, no morals, no convictions, no disciplines, no separation from the holy and the profane, from the righteous and the unrighteous. They don't preach on holiness. They don't preach on these things. Okay? So again, John... 15, 8, Holy Spirit will come and he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness. And then it leads us to the next and the final thing, and that's judgment. Okay? And I know this is a cuss word in the body of Christ today too, is the word judgment. We don't want to hear about judgment. But here's the truth, okay? If you're born again, you have passed from death unto life. Therefore, you and I, if we continue and remain in the faith until the day that either the Lord comes back or we go to be with the Lord, there is coming a time, according to the book of Revelation, that you and I as believers, those who have accepted Christ, will be judged at the Bema, which is the judgment seat of Christ, where we will be given rewards for what we did in the flesh. But those who have rejected the gospel and they have died in their sins, they will be judged at the great white throne judgment and they will ultimately, their name will not be found in the Lamb's book of life and they will be tossed into the lake of fire that burneth forever with the, with the Antichrist, the false prophet, with the beast and all these will be in this lake of fire and all whose names were not found in the book of life. This is all the word again. But isn't it interesting that Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, one of the first things he's going to do, his primary message is going to be to convict the world 
of sin. In other words, he's going to come and he's going to warn men and women to repent and turn and give their heart to Jesus Christ. Number two, he's going to convict the world of righteousness. In other words, Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to draw a plumb line and he's going to say, I know the culture says this is acceptable. I know the world says this is acceptable and this is what's popular. But according to my word, according to what my father says according to what Jesus says the this is the standard this is what truth is this world and the fashion of it is passing away but he who remains and abides in the word will not pass away and is passed from death unto life okay and then judgment even the word of the Lord says that judgment begins in the house of God is that not what the word of the Lord says Again, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when Paul is dealing with a man who is committing uh, fornic- or he's committing adultery in the church or fornication rather, sexual immorality and, it's, and, it's, and it gets back to the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul writes a, a letter to the church of Corinth. He rebukes the pastor. He rebukes the congregation because they've turned a blind eye to the sin that's in the body. And he writes to them and he says, I'm going to present to you on how to deal and how to judge uh, this matter according to the word of God. But yet again, we don't, want to, we don't want to talk about this. We don't want to preach about this. And we want to sweep this under the rug. But guys, when I was doing my devotional on this the other day, when I was getting into my reading of the Word of God and the Lord showed me to this and this leaped off, off the pages at me and, and the Lord revealed to me, He said, Son, it's not... He says it's one thing when preachers don't want to preach things because of fear of persecution or fear of losing popularity or fear of losing people or fear of losing money. He said that's one thing. He said, but when they refuse to preach on sin, righteousness, and judgment, he said they are silencing the very Holy Spirit and the purpose of Him coming into the earth. Guys, now, I don't know, that may not do nothing for you, but I'm talking about, you talking about the fear of God. This is absolutely frightening that we have come to a time that we are seeing this in the church today. Now, let me read on to verse 9. He, he expounds on this. He says, of sin because they do not believe in me. Number 10, or verse 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you will see me no more. Verse 11, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, who's the ruler of this world? Satan. Now, if he's going to be judged, and if you if you partner with Satan, and Satan's going to be judged, guess what? You are going to be judged with Satan. And again, according to the book of Revelation, it says that your destiny will be the same as his. Matthew 25, 41, and then he will also say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. John 3, uh, let me go on down here. Oh, let's, let's listen to this. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away from. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to the works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now listen to verse 15 of Revelation 20. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now I'm sure if we want to get a big offering, we'll preach that on a Sunday morning. And I'm sure uh, we'll just get a great offering on that. And that'll that'll just build the church right up. No. And this is why you're not hearing this preaching today. But watch this. Jesus said in John 15, 11, Uh, or 12 he says I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now 
Yeah, you're right, Jesus, because we can't even bear the preaching of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The church can't even handle these three things anymore. That's why they don't want to hear it anymore. In verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Oh, come on, you need to think. Somebody needs to thank God for the Holy Spirit today. For the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears. And by the way, the Holy Spirit doesn't give an ear to whoever he chooses to. The Holy Spirit only listens to the Father when the Father speaks. My Lord, there's a lesson for you right there. He only speaks. He does not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, that he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Oh, I know there's a whole group of individuals out there today that want to tell you that if you hear from God, and I heard this with my own ears. I went to a church right here in Indiana. It's probably the largest largest church in my, I'm not going to say where it's at, but the largest church here in the city of where I'm at in Indiana. I, my wife and I went one time, and you, some of y'all have heard me preach this before, but I got there one, I, we, went, we went to a service one time, and I heard with my own ears the pastor of the church st- behind the pulpit say that if you hear from God, if you hear the voice of God, if you're out here and there's there's a couple thousand people in the congregation and plus people listening to on television, he says, if you hear from God today, you are either way more spiritual than I am or you are flat crazy. And I, I stood there numb after he said this and I, and I looked at, I looked at Melissa and I said, Did he just say what I think he said? She said, yes. She said, you just heard him say that if if we say we hear from God, then we are either way more spiritual than this guy or we're a nut job. And I said, can you believe the pastor of the church, the guy who they look up to as their leadership has just told them, that if they hear from God, they are a loon, they are a nut, and they've lost their mind. But you, listen, I see people's comments and they're like, wow, I can't believe this. Shake my head. Guys, listen, they are doing this all across the nation. I hear pastors constantly that will make these same remarks or they will tell you the Holy Spirit doesn't operate through the church today. That powers, signs, wonders, and miracles and healings are done away with and that they 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 were ceased in the 4th century and God doesn't work in the miracle working business today. I've even had people say that God don't even save people anymore. Are you listening? But but Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes he will re, he will reveal things to you that have not yet happened. Now listen. So are you saying are you saying preacher that God speaks today? Yes. Does he speak to the Holy Spirit to us today? Yes. Can he reveal to us the things of the future through dreams and visions? Yes. But again Well, how do we know if it's God? It will line up with His Word because the Holy Spirit is not going to speak to you anything contrary to than the voice, the Word, and the attributes of the Father who sent Him. Come on, that's good preaching right there. You you need to amen me, shout something, do something right there because that's good preaching right there. I just helped somebody right there. Verse 14, Holy Spirit will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and he will declare it to you. Okay? Oh, my Lord. Help me, Holy Ghost. Don't let me get in trouble right here. Listen, if the Holy Spirit's been sent to us by the Father to speak to us, to help us, to comfort us, to equip us, to, to, to use us to preach the gospel, then listen to me, preacher. Listen to me, pastor. Listen to me, whoever you are in leadership, in the name of Jesus. Who are you to stand in his way? Who are you to suppress him and put him in a closet somewhere and keep him from touching the people. When there's sick people coming into the congregation that need a touch from the Holy Spirit, they need a they need a miracle in their body, they need to be healed in their body. Who are you to come along to be the voice of reason or the voice of justice and tell the people that that the Holy Spirit does not heal today and he shouldn't and he and we don't want him touching people, so you lock him up in the closet while 
you go get your message on the internet because heaven knows that you're not going to get in a secret place and get some fresh manna from God. Instead, you want to get on the internet or turn on some sermon and get somebody else's message and you want to preach something that's been regurgitated and recycled instead of something that's fresh, some fresh revelation and fresh and something that will transform and set the people free. So instead, because you're all, because you're so concerned about your popularity, concerned about your numbers, concerned about your money, concerned about your building program, concerned about your accolades, your position, your title, your name, and everything out there, that you are willing to lock the Holy Spirit up in some cage in a back room and tell him that he, he that you can't, that he cannot disrupt the service, that he cannot come and have his way because heaven forbid that he'd come and make the service a little bit longer. Heaven forbid that he'd come and set somebody free and they might just disrupt the service because of their shouting or they might start weeping or heaven forbid somebody would be would come under a blanket of conviction and run screaming to the altar and begin to weep and travail crying out to Jesus to save them. And, and we don't want all that disruption in the church because it might disrupt and it might it might upset the big business people and the big tithers and the big elegant uh you know the, the those who they, they they've got all their ducks in a row their t's crossed their you know their their t's crossed their eyes dotted and and they, they want a somber jesus and they want a a quiet jesus they don't want a shouting jesus they don't want a praising jesus they don't want a healing jesus they don't want a delivering jesus they don't want a jesus that sets people free they don't want a jesus to cast out devils. They don't want a Jesus that raises the dead. They just want to feel good, motivational speaking Jesus that's going to make them feel good in their sins, comfort them in their iniquity, and let them hear how good of a person they really are. Oh, friends, but I got to, I've come by to tell you today, what if, what if we, what if we unlock that door? What if we let Holy Spirit out of his cage? What if he let him out of his room? And just for once, we just took our notes and said, you know what? If I don't get to preach today, that's okay because I'm going to throw my notes to the side and say, Holy Spirit, it's always been about you. Jesus, it's always been about you. It has never been about anything. It's not been about me. It's never been about my ministry. It's never about been about my personality or my platform. It's been about you because you said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men into, your, into, into myself. And just what if, what if we'd said one day, Holy Spirit, you have your way today. I'm going to tell you what would happen friend. I'm telling you, preacher, you wouldn't have to spend three or four hours trying to copy some internet message and getting everything, your I's dotted, your T's crossed, and to be able to roll your R's and articulate this and be able to come up with some great uh, message that's going to confound the people and entertain them and tickle their ears. Instead, you will see the drug addicts run into the altar. You will see the prostitutes weep and be delivered. Come on, somebody. You'll see the sick being healed. You'll see people that will refuse to go to the doctors, but instead, they'll be coming and lining up the sick like they did in the book of Acts on the porch that the shadow of Peter might pass over them and heal them and deliver them. Come on. You won't have to exhaust your efforts on seminars and conferences and strategies on how to build churches and how to build this and how to build that. Instead, friend, Holy Spirit will come in and He will draw men unto Himself. He will convict the sinners. He will convict the, uh, the come on, the, uh, the, the backsliders will come and run to the altar because of their lifestyles, because Holy Spirit is the one who truly needs to have the voice in this hour. Listen, we are mere nothing but vessels. But friends, if I ever get to a point in my ministry where I've got to suppress the voice of the Holy Spirit to keep my followers. And by the way, they're not my followers. They're just people that are looking to Jesus. Listen, I appreciate every one of you guys on Facebook and YouTube. And you may say, well, I follow End Time Headlines. Guys, listen, it's not about me. It never was about me or this ministry. You guys are just hungry for Jesus. You're hungry for the Word. You're hungry for truth. And you're being drawn by the Holy Spirit. Because, listen, I had someone talk to me yesterday. I, I, I got a message from someone yesterday. And they said, uh, and, and I was very disturbed because they said, 
I have been very disturbed lately because I'm seeing a lot of, and I'm not going to name names here, but a lot of well-named and well, well-known well preachers that are, and they're well-known on media and social media platforms, uh, Facebook, Periscope, and different places like that. Uh, and they, and these people come out and this is what I heard. I, these, these people always have something to say and they've always got some new slogan They've always got some new catchy phrase and some new slogan, but I never see them open their word. I never hear them preach the gospel according to the word, and I, ne- and I hardly ever hear them even quote a scripture. But they've always got something to say, but it seems like it's something new, and it's something extra biblical, and it's something that's, a, a, again, a catchy phrase or a catchy slogan, but it's never from the word of God. And I told them, I said, you better run. You better get away from from those individuals. In fact, I, I want to be the opposite. I, if I can't find what I'm about to tell you from the Word of God, then I need to shut up and sit down and call it quits. Come on, somebody. You better amen me on that one today, friends. So that's what I've got for you today, friends. This is what the Lord put in my heart uh, a, a couple days ago and yesterday. Um, I was really getting into this word, putting the notes together for this thing. And, and the Holy Spirit was really just showing me some things today. Guys, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, I thank God for my pastor that I have here. And listen, a lot of times I don't mention for, for safety reasons because there's nuts out there. But I thank God for my pastor. I thank God for my church. And I thank God that he's a holy, Go- him and his wife both are Holy Ghost filled. And they don't lock the Holy Spirit up in a back closet somewhere. And I thank God that I'm submitted under uh, 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 a man of God who hears from the Holy Spirit, operates from the Holy Spirit, and allows the Holy Spirit to speak to people. And I know, listen, there's so many of you guys out there that you can't find a church that is like that. And I get it, friends. I get it. They are a diamond in the rough. They're a needle in a haystack. And this is why the Lord has really put it on our hearts to do what we do, is to help many people uh, that don't have that opportunity. We want to be a voice to help people, to encourage people, to edify people, uh, and to see people's lives transformed. And we want the Holy Spirit to work and operate through us. So I'm going to pray for you guys today, and we're going to let you go. And we're going to be back on here on Sunday afternoon. because we've got a lot of people that we want to uh, recognize and thank letters and stuff right before, because we know Christmas is coming up. And listen to me, guys, uh, before we uh, before I close and before we pray, we are getting ready to, uh, as of January, when we get into January, uh, I, myself, my church, um, and many churches, uh, Jensen Franklin, uh, Free Chapel Worship Center, uh, Pastor Bob Rogers, Evangel World Prayer Center, many churches, we're all joining together in a corporate time of prayer and fasting, 21 days of prayer and fasting. We do this every year, and I'm excited about this, and I've got a whole series on prayer and fasting. Some of you have heard me do this in the past. Every year, you guys got to, you might as well get used to it because we've got newcomers coming on here. We've got uh, all kinds of new followers, and we're going to do a whole series on 21 days or just prayer and fasting. We're going to talk about individual fasting versus corporate fasting. We're going to talk about different types of fasting, why we should fast, how we should fast, uh, what we should believe God for during fasting. We're going to, we're going to talk about all this. And I'm excited about this because I am believing God for powerful things for 2018. Now, listen, I'm not going to get up. Now, listen, you, you, you don't have to worry about me. You don't have to worry about this ministry getting up and giving you some cliche, catchy, slogan, New Year's word. Uh, in fact, I wrote an article about that a couple of years ago and I resurfaced this. Every single year you watch, every single year starting about right now, all the way to the end of the year, you're going to you're gonna start hearing all these people get up on Christian television and on Facebook, on YouTube, and blogs and articles all over the place. And they're going to say, the Lord showed me, the Lord said, and it's all going to, you know, here's something interesting to think about today. Uh, this morning, when I when I, right after I was, I, I got into a time of prayer, and I got out, you know, when I was done, and I was getting dressed, getting ready for my day, and the Lord dropped something in my spirit, and I want to, I want to share this with you real quick, and He said, "Isn't it interesting how if you go to the Old Testament, all the prophets of that day, 
The false prophets of that day. There was 350 prophets of Baal. You had Ahab and Jezebel. The prophets that ate, ate at Jezebel's table. Uh, then you had Micaiah. Micaiah was the real prophet. Elijah was the real prophet. And these prophets were condemned. And they were persecuted. Micaiah was locked in a dungeon. But all the pro- the majority, listen to me. The, and I'm, my God, I'm gonna, I may have to preach a message on this. This might be my next sermon. But all the prophets, consequently enough, all the prophets of that day, the majority, of the prophets who spoke in that day all their voices sound the same they had the same message and it was always a positive message but it was never a message of correction rebuke uh um or or turning from anything it was always a message of correction or uh, i'm sorry a message of a feel-good message and i can prove that i don't i don't have all my notes and from so here's If we take that as a parallel, that tells me that today, the majority of quote unquote prophetic voices out there, the majority, I'm not saying there's not prophetic voices. There is a remnant and there always was. Remember, there was a remnant that was hidden in the caves from Ahab and Jezebel. We know that. And even the Lord spoke to Elijah, there was a remnant, but they were being persecuted. But the majority of the voices out there are speaking the same recycled and regurgitated jargon every single year. You can find it, and I'm not going to mention publications or anything, but you go and look on Christian networks and Christian publications, and you're going to see it. It's the same thing every single year, same recycled and regurgitated jargons that are uh, that are either uh, that are that are added to or taken away somehow and made up and dressed up to to give to the people. And it's usually, uh, you know, yay, the Lord's going to prosper. Yay, the Lord's blessing you. Yay, you've got the favor of the Lord. Yay, the door, you know, this, that. It's all, it's never negative. Never. Never is it correction. Never is it is it turning from uh, from sin. Never is it turning from your backslidden state. It's never that. Okay. Am I saying that prophecy shouldn't exhort, edify, and comfort? Nope. I'm saying that there has to be a balance. Come on, use some discernment about you, friends. So uh, anyway, having said that, let me pray for you guys. We're going to be back on here Sunday and do a, uh, a, a, we're going to pray for you guys and thank some people, our supporters, and those who uh, continually are blessing to this ministry. So Father, I thank you for those under the sound of my voice, those that are watching today. Lord, I bless them today. God, I'm asking that today that we, Lord, help us. You said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of the stranger they know not, nor will they follow. So Lord, I'm asking that you would give us the ability to hear clear from the Holy Spirit, that we would not, uh, that we would not suppress, that we would not quench, that we would not vex the Holy Spirit. But Lord, that we would be submissive to the Holy Spirit. We would be quick to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. We would be quick to uh, to do what He asked us to do. And God, we ask that You would forgive us. Lord, we repent of if we have quenched, vexed, or suppressed the Holy Spirit in any way in our lives, any, any, any form or fashion in any way. Holy Spirit, we ask You to forgive us. And Father, we ask You to forgive us. And we ask that we would be vessels and that you would use us to be a mouthpiece of the Holy Ghost in this hour. And that, Lord, we would allow him to preach these three things that we talked about today. And that we would not fear man, but we would fear you, God. And we thank you, Father, for the fruit that will abound because we've been obedient to both you and your word. And we thank you and we receive it today in Jesus' name. Come on. And everybody said, Amen.